Lecture 11, Intro to Evolutionary Computing, and we will talk about evolutionary algorithms as part of evolutionary computing. So what is evolutionary computing? I'm going to say EC for evolutionary computing, EA for evolutionary algorithms, GA for genetic algorithms. So we'll talk about all of those concepts. I just want you to know what those uh, the acronyms are, so I can just say EC. So EC traditionally has been a part of computer science. It is not traditionally a part of life sciences or biology. So if you go take a biology degree, you probably, um, you probably have heard of evolutionary computing, but I don't think there's an evolutionary computing course in the biology department. But biology is the entire inspiration for the methodology and the terminology in evolutionary computing. So we're borrowing basically, what does nature do to solve its problems? We're going to translate that into um, computing, and then we'll see if it can solve our problems. So EC, even though it's not traditionally a part of biology, it's inspired biology by biology, and it can be applied in biological research, but it has many, many, many possible applications. And evolutionary computing is essentially just a, a category of problem solving or decision making algorithms. So just like we had uh, heuristic search, there's evolutionary computing. And based on the properties of our environment, um, and the properties of our problem, we may or may not be able to apply methods in evolutionary computing to solve those problems. So what does it really mean? Um, evolutionary computing has a lot of metaphors and analogies to like nature and how nature solves problems, right? So in nature, in evolution, so we evolutionary computation is essentially um, mimicking the way that nature performs evolution in order to solve the problem of fitness and being and reproduction in in the in the real world right so in the actual in in actual evolution so in actual nature um, we have these concepts and the analogies to those within our problem solving are over here okay so in problem solving we have a problem that problem could be whatever problem. In evolution, that problem is essentially the environment, right? The environment defines the problem. In problem solving, we might have a candidate solution, like here's a possible solution, how good it is. In evolution, we would have an individual, right? So we would have a population of individuals. Over here, when we do problem solving, like for example, when we did heuristic search, we may have, okay, let's search all the different possible paths, right? Well, that in evolution is all the different individuals in the environment. And then the quality of a solution, the quality of a, of a candidate solution, um, for example, we had some sort of performance metric that we defined. It might be the length of the path. It might be um, how many games it won. In the evolution metaphor, that is the fitness of the um, of the individual. So the quality fitness thing here is very important. So the quality is the chance for seeding a new solution in problem solving, and the fitness is the chance of survival and reproduction. Okay. So what we're going to be doing, and we'll we'll get into this in great detail, is in order to have a problem that we want to be solved by evolutionary computation, we have to define things like what is the environment, what is the individual, and what is the fitness, and all of that will come from the problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, there is a history to evolutionary computation. I am not a like world expert in evolutionary computation, but I just want you to know that this is not a new field of research. Um, even Turing, back in the 1940s, talked about in the future how there may be some sort of genetical or evolutionary search. Um, Bremerman talked about optimization through evolution in the 60s. Um, evolutionary strategies were in the 60s. Evolutionary programming in the 60s. Um, genetic algorithms, which is the thing we will be studying most in this course, came about in the 70s. And then genetic programming, which we'll talk a little bit about in the next um, lecture, are was in the 90s. And so this is decades, decades, decades old research. Um, doesn't mean it's not still modern. Uh, it's still being used in many areas. 
Um, even though, you know, neural nets are the hot new machine learning, this is sort of the old hot machine learning. Um, and right before neural nets took off, evolutionary computation was sort of the flavor of the month when it came to solving complex problems. And of course, in 2022, we have assignment four, right? So we are adding to our little bit of history when it comes to evolutionary computation. All right. So, um, Darwinian evolution, survival of the fittest. This is what we are going to be mimicking when we do evolutionary computation. So we, were take, we are taking the biological theory of evolution and we are translating that into the theory of that should be able to work in computers as well. Okay. So in order to do that, let's review what evolution says, right? Darwinian evolution specifically. So all environments that exist in the real world have finite resources, right? So for example, if I'm a cow and I'm trying to eat, there's a finite amount of grass. If I am a lion trying to eat cows, there is a finite amount of cows, right? There's a finite amount of water. There are finite resources that I am competing for. So life forms in that environment have a some sort of basic instinct that they're born with, and the life cycle of every individual is just geared toward reproduction, right? So you can tell how successful a population is. Now, okay, when I talk about all of this, let's remove humans from the picture, okay? Because when we talk about humans, we have societies and monetary systems and, you know, there's rich people who sort of defy evolution. And so let's let's remove humans. We're talking about like animals that, you know, older animals than, than humans. So pretty much you can tell how successful an, an organism is by how many of them there are, right? So every organism, its measure of success is just how many of them. I have reproduced, therefore I'm taking over this part of the world, right? That's, that's basically it. The more of you there are, the more successful you have been. So therefore, if there's a finite amount of resources and the base instinct of every thing is to reproduce, then there must be some sort of selection that happens, right? So that selection is like, which of you are going to live and which of you are going to reproduce, or which of you are going to reproduce and which of you are going to not reproduce. And because everything eventually dies, that's basically which lives and which dies. So individuals that compete for resources most effectively have increased chance of reproduction, right? So if there's two animals out there and one of them is bigger and stronger and there's one chicken, that they're trying to compete for, well, whoever wins the fight for the chicken is going to survive, right? Now, it doesn't always mean that something is more, is, is stronger, right? Because maybe they fight and then strength wins, but maybe you have something like a hyena who may not be stronger than a lion, but might be faster or sneakier and, and get the, the food, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean it's the fastest thing or the sneakiest thing or the strongest thing. It's no single attribute. It's just that some sort of selection occurs, you're competing for resources, and the ones that compete most effectively for resources and get the resources are the ones that are probably going to reproduce the most, right? Because you need those resources to reproduce. So fitness in nature is a derived secondary measure. Okay, so this is, this is gonna be an important concept. So if you think about it, we might have an intuitive notion of what a fit individual is, right? So if we think about humans, maybe we're thinking about like someone in the Olympics, right? Um, or if we think about an animal, maybe we're talking about like a fast animal. But this sort of fitness is something that we are thinking about when it comes to animals, when in reality, the real fitness measure is just who reproduces the most. Because if you reproduce the most, there will eventually be more of you than someone else. So if there was some lion out there that could juggle, you know, 10 balls at once, it doesn't, doesn't really matter because the ones that reproduced are the ones that, that are more fit. So when we talk about fitness, especially when it comes to evolutionary computation, that is something we as humans are giving as a quality when in the real world, fitness is literally just who has survived and who hasn't.
okay? Now that's if we take humans out of the mix because humans are this weird outlier that uses guns and stuff, right? So when we're talking about nature and animals, this is, this is the evolutionary thing that we're talking about. So in Darwinian evolution, there are different types of traits, okay? So phenotypic traits. Now there is going to be some new terminology in this lecture. There's going to be a lot of words thrown around, but before we get too into it, I just want you to know that on the final exam, I am not going to ask anything that directly relates to biology, okay? The only questions that I would ask about um, evolutionary computation on the final exam relate to the algorithmic processes that we will be learning and not all of these terminologies when it comes to biology. Because I am going to give the sort of nature-inspired biological reasons that thing ha things happen before I give the, um, the algorithms for those. But you should still understand it even if you don't need to regurgitate it for an exam. So phenotypic traits. This phenotype, this is going to be an important word. This word could be on an exam because this word relates to our algorithm later. So the phenotypic traits, they are behaviors and physical differences that affect individual responses to the environment. They are partly determined by inheritance and partly by factors during development. So this is the whole nature versus nurture thing, right? Like why was, I don't know, Michael Jordan so good at basketball? Well, he was probably good in part because he had really great training right? That's the nurture part. And also maybe he had good genetics that made him tall or the ability to run fast, right? So that's the, the nature part. So there's this big debate, you know, nature versus nurture, what makes you better at something? Well, we're just going to stop at, at the realization that it's a little bit of both. The phenotypic traits are unique to each individual and they are partly a result of random changes when, when we're talking about evolution. If a phenotypic trait leads to higher chances of reproduction, then these traits are passed off to offspring, inherited. Along with random mutations, this leads to new combination of traits that lead to more fit individuals, so more offspring. So for example, a phenotypic trait could be how physically strong the individual is, right? And so if, being physically strong leads to a higher chance of reproduction, then the stronger individuals will probably reproduce and there's a higher chance that their offspring will also be strong individuals, okay? So if specific phenotypic traits lead to higher chances of reproduction, then those traits will be passed, off to, uh, passed on to offspring. All right, so let's keep going. There are going to be, here are some definitions that we're going to be talking about during this lecture. So a population consists of many different individuals. So for example, later when we run our algorithm, we may have a population of a thousand individuals. If we're talking about uh, mice in the real world, there may be millions or billions in that population. Combinations of traits that are better suited for a given environment lead to a higher chance of reproduction. Okay, so what that means is the individuals are the unit of selection. So variations occurring through random changes yield a constant source of diversity and coupling that with selection means that the population is the unit of evolution. So what do these two things mean? It means that Individuals are the things that are selected from an environment, right? Like that, that individual is fitter in some way, so, or its phenotypic traits led to it either being selected for reproduction or it does not reproduce. So un individuals are the unit of selection. Individuals are selected for reproduction or not. However, individuals do not undergo evolution. That is a very important concept. A single individual does not evolve. A population evolves over time, okay? So if, a, if an individual throughout its lifetime, for example, learns something, that is not 
evolution. I did not evolve because I learned how to do C++. I did not evolve because I learned how to, how to make fire. Okay. Now the, the consequences of knowing how to make fire may eventually change the unit of selection for my individual, but that's still an individual. And over time, the population evolves, not the individual. So that's a very important concept. Okay. Now we're going to talk a little bit about genetics. Warning, I am not a biologist. So I know just enough to give you this information, and I know just enough to know that this is probably true, <laughs> but um, I have never, at, <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing, through all of junior high, high school, undergraduate, masters and PhD, I have never taken a single biology course. I know it sounds a bit weird, but I did AP math and physics. I never touched biology, but I, I have looked at the textbooks when it comes to this stuff. So I'm not a biologist. So try not to ask me too much more than I'm going to put on these slides, but I assure you that what I'm, what I'm going to say should make sense at least. And I've run it past a few biologist friends and they said, okay, Dave, that's, that's good enough. All right. So the information required to build a living organism is called the organism's DNA. Think of DNA as the source code for an individual, right? That is, that is a good analogy. The DNA is the source code. The genotype, the, that is the DNA, determines the phenotype, okay? So the genotype is the encoding. It's the DNA. It's the source code. Based on what your genotype is, based on what your DNA is, that is going to determine the phenotype, which is the traits, okay? So for example, your genetic code determines if you're strong or not, right? So genotype is the code, is the representation in DNA. Phenotype is the actual trait realization. That is a very important concept going forward. It's the third time I've repeated it. So yes, it's very important. Genotype to phenotypic traits is a complex mapping. What that means is biologists have identified some traits in some animals that are directly related to some genes, but other traits are very complex and may be like related to multiple genes. So one gene may affect many traits and many genes may affect one trait. So just like source code is very complex, right? Like for example, if I gave you like the source code for Windows and I just changed a few numbers, could you tell me what was going to happen? No, it's, it's so complex and DNA is arguably way more complex than any source code any human has ever written, okay? So just realize that the genotype has genes and those genes affect the phenotypic traits, like the actual traits like strength, speed, how your face looks, stuff like that. Changes in genotype may lead to changes in the organism, height, hair color, etc. So if I change part of your genetics, it may lead to changes in the next organism that comes from that genetics, okay? So genes and the genomes. So inside our genome consists of the dioxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and some nitrogenous bases. So we have essentially A, T, C, and G, all right? Genes are functional units of stretches of DNA on chromosomes. The complete genetic material in an individual's genotype is called the genome. So if you've ever heard of the Human Genome Project, that is essentially trying to take the human genome and map it out into A, T, C, and G. All right, that's what that is. So for Homo sapiens, which is us, the most modern version of humans, um, our DNA is organized into chromosomes. Um, human body cells contain typically 23 pairs of chromosomes, which together define the physical attributes of the individual. I'm not gonna get into any more details than that, other than just to let you know, we have chromosomes, they help define our physical characteristics. Reproductive cells. So gametes, sperm and egg cells, contain 23 individual chromosomes rather than 23 pairs of chromosomes. The gametes are formed by a special form of spell splitting, splitting called meiosis. 
Don't worry, the biology won't be on the exam. During meiosis, the pairs of chromosomes undergo an operation called crossover. Crossover shares genetic information from both parents to form offspring. So why am I telling you this? Well, this is sort of what it looks like. There are some chromosomes from each parent. Those chromosomes undergo some sort of crossover, meaning that genetic information from one goes to the, and genetic information from another goes on to form the next generation. Okay, so the sperm and egg cell, they meet. Some of the information from the sperm cell and some of the information from the egg cell, they cross over. You get part of the traits from one parent. You get part of the traits from another parent. This is a very simple example of crossover. Crossover can take many, many forms. Single crossover, double crossover. Um, there's also like you can have like more than just two things doing crossover. There's all sorts of crossover that happens, okay? It just means that there's some genetic code from one or more parents, genetic code like from a bunch of parents, and then they combine somehow to form the genetic code of a child. And so this is what we get. Um, typically in human reproduction, we get the sperm cell from a father, egg cell from a mother, and then they combine to form a new person cell, okay, the zygote. Okay. So all proteins in life on Earth are combined of sequences built from 20 different amino acids that we know of so far. DNA is built from four nucleotides in a double helix spiral, um, A, G, T, and C. Triplets from these codons, each of which codes for a specific amino acid. And the genetic code is essentially the mapping from codons to amino acids. I should just take that slide out of there because it's just confusing. But essentially, genetic code tells the universe how to put us together. All right? So we have our genetic code. Um, it, you know, do we have a functional liver? Well, that's in our genetic code. Uh, parts of our brain are in the right or the wrong place. That's in our genetic code. Partly like how our muscles form. That's in our genetic code. What our face looks like. That's in our genetic code. Um, some animals have had their genetic code mapped out very, very well. And you can tell like specific parts of a fruit fly, for example, um, does it have this particular aspect of his eye? Is that like, what, what color is it? They actually know what part of the genome that comes from. Um, the human face, for example, they have found strong correlations between part of um, the human genome and uh, specific aspects of the face and how the face ends up looking. So just to let you know that the genetic code, your source code, ends up determining essentially who you are physically and partially mentally. Okay. So one of the last parts of this whole um, thing, after, you know, we've got reproduction, we've got selection, we've got mutation. So occasionally, some of the genetic material changes very slightly during the process. That can happen either by replication error or by the environment. So essentially, you've got the sperm and the egg, or you've got the algorithm, whatever. You've got the DNA that's combining from, from however many parents you have. And it's a very complex process. And sometimes during that process, your computer could glitch out, right? And there's a replication error. So there's a small error in the child's DNA. And that error could also be caused by something in the environment. Like for example, if there was a nuclear explosion or the sun had too many gamma rays that day or, or whatever. Either by some usually radioactive thing that happens or a physical thing that happens or by replication error, some of the DNA that ends up in a child could not come from one of the parents, okay? It, is, it has been changed somehow. It happens quite infrequently but when it does happen, one of three things could happen based on that mutation. So the first thing and the worst thing that could happen is, is a catastrophic event in which the change in mutation, let's say, for example, the part of the code that formed your brain was damaged and you may have uh, an offspring that has no brain and is just brain dead. Right? So it could be completely catastrophic, like the offspring is just not viable whatsoever. Otherwise, uh, it could be neutral. It could be like, you know, 
some data in RAM somewhere that ended up really not mattering and it's just completely neutral, so you don't really notice what happens. Or it could be advantageous, right? We could get hit with that gamma ray that turned Bruce Banner into the Hulk or whatever. Or, you know, maybe um, we get uh, a new piece of DNA that says we should have seven fingers on each hand and we're in an environment where a seven finger would really help us, right? So it could either be catastrophic, complete failure, neutral, we don't care, or advantageous, meaning we are new, we are now uh, more fit for the particular environment. But here's the most important thing about evolution, and it is what really, I'm not getting into the politics of evolution. Evolution is, is observed. It, it happens, okay? But the thing that people really misunderstand about evolution is the following thing. Right. Like I've talked to some people about evolution who could say who said like, yeah, but how did it know to do that? How did it know that being fast was advantageous? How did it know to, to change in that way? That's that's not how evolution works. Evolution is depressingly simple. Individuals do not intentionally change themselves to suit an environment. The, the individual does not choose its characteristics. There is no learning involved in evolution, okay? You get a population of individuals. Some of them had, have had random mutations. Some of them have had DNA passed down from their parents. Inside that population, the individuals that are better suited to survive in that environment reproduce, and the ones that are less suited to, to reproduce or to survive in that environment don't reproduce. That's it. So the good traits, there's no such thing as a good trait. There's a good trait for an environment. And I'll give you an example of that in a bit. So the good traits for that environment are passed to the offspring. Typically, over time, what this means is it will produce fitter individuals over time than the parent, on average. Random mutations can introduce new traits, and those new traits might make you better suited. They might make you worse suited. And this process eventually, over time, produces more fit populations for an environment. So just realize that there's nothing really special happening with evolution. It's just that nature and through reproduction, it produces a bunch of new things. And the things that happen to survive reproduce. And so their traits, the things that probably made them able to reproduce, get passed on. And that's it. And you become better at that environment over time. That's all that evolution is. And it might seem like strange, like, you know, okay, so there's this like kind of random chance. Yeah. If you produce enough random things and then you take the good parts with a sprinkling of randomness, you get better stuff. And we'll actually show that with assignment four. You'll see, oh, wow, that's actually, it's a pretty strong process of optimization. And it's kind of dep <laughs> it's a depressing in a way when you think about that's how we came about, right? But it is just you take this and you bake it for a long time and you get human beings. Here's an example that humans observed happening within a span of a few decades. Okay, this is called this is like sort of the the perfect example of evolution. So yes, I'm cherry picking it a little bit, but there are other good examples as well. Typically, evolution happens over thousands or millions of years, so it's not observable directly, but this one happened in a human's lifetime, so it is very observable. So what happened was in England, I believe it was England, or let's just say Europe to be safe, there was this animal called the peppered moth. The peppered moth was called the peppered moth because it kind of looked like pepper, right? It had that like spotted black spots. It was basically beige or white with black spots on it. Now, the peppered moth, in the area that it lived, there were these trees, there were these light-colored trees. Let's say there was a birch tree or something. Uh, uh, no, don't say birch tree. Something that looks light. And these peppered moths were light, right? When they, when they were born, they had a light color, so they were very camouflaged against this tree. However, through some genetic mutations that happened, some of them were born with a darker color, right? And so if you have a light colored tree and you have some individuals that are blending into that tree 
and some individuals that are standing out on that tree and a bird flies by, it's going to very easily be able to see the individuals that are darker colored. If there's a light colored tree, it would be exactly the opposite if the tree was dark colored, right? So what happened was, you know, you get a population, the vast majority of them have adapted over time to these light colored trees. They're very camouflaged. And the ones that are born darker, they get eaten. And so they do not have a chance to reproduce. And so more and more light colored ones get, get born. So that was the state of the peppered moth throughout known history. Then in England, the industrial revolution started happening. And what did the industrial revolution do? It pumped a ton of smoke and soot into the environment. And what did that do? Over the course of a few years, decades, maybe a century, I can't, I don't know how exactly how long it was. The trees changed color. All of this soot changed the color of the trees. Okay. Whether it was the soot directly on the tree or it went into the ground and then made the tree, I don't know, but the trees changed color. So now what happened? This population that was initially very light colored now had to survive on these dark trees. And you had still a few dark ones being born, but now when the dark ones were born, they were the ones camouflaged, right? And the light colored ones were now the easy pickings for the birds or other animals that wanted to eat them. So over time, because the dark ones were now better suited for that environment, they were the ones that were surviving. And so over time, like within a human's lifetime, you saw these peppered moths go from a light colored species to a dark colored species through the process of evolution and being suited for their environment. Now, you can see from this example that it really makes intuitive sense, right? But there was no, there was no committee of moths that sat around painting themselves or did any genetic experiments, right? Or like wanted to be darker. It was just initially when there were light colored trees, the light ones survived. And then later when there were darker colored trees, the darker ones survived. And then whatever ones were surviving were the ones that reproduced more. And so the population tended toward that. That's it. That's what happened. And that's one of the coolest examples of evolution that, that I've seen. And it happened pretty quickly. So, all right. Why do we want evolutionary computation? We've talked about evolution and how that works in the environment and in the real world. What about evolutionary computation? So nature has always served as an inspiration for engineers and scientists, right? We, all, we get a ton of information from the, from the environment and from nature. Developing new problem-solving methods or algorithms is a central theme in math, in computer science. We always want to have better and better decision-making processes, better optimization processes, etc. And as we get more and more data, as the world becomes more and more connected, the complexity of our problem space grows exponentially, right? So the problems we had to solve back in the 50s, not as complex as we have to solve now 70 years later. And so robust problem solving technology is required. And so what we get is we get problems that are too complex for existing algorithms. So for example, we talked about heuristic search and how it's really great in some cases, but we couldn't possibly apply exhaustive search to some problems that we have just because there are so many possible solutions. We might have a real valued space, right? So let's say if we look back at heuristic search, what if our um, action space was real valued? What if we had to choose a floating point number? Well, how do you search through all possible floating point numbers, right? It's not possible. So let's try to use evolution as a problem solving algorithm. And so EC can simulate evolutionary processes with millions of generations. The problem with nature is that it happens at the time span of like actual life. But if we can come up with a good fast simulator for whatever problem that we're trying to solve, we can apply millions of generations per second, maybe, right? And we can simulate trillions of years of evolution. And so if we can model the problem in terms of an environment, individuals, and those individuals having fitnesses, and then those individuals reproduce to form new candidate solutions, then perhaps EC can provide solutions for our problem.
So here's an example of that. Um, let's take a problem of exam scheduling, right? Exam scheduling is actually a very complex problem. If you think about it, the problem components, all right, let's try and schedule the final exams at MUN. We've got, I don't know, let's say we got a thousand profs, we have 20,000 students, 500 rooms, 500 courses, and 50 different time slots. Okay, we have constraints that we need to satisfy. No student or prof should have more than one exam at a time. No room has more than one exam at a time. And no student should have more than three exams in a day. It's a gigantic search space. If we multiply the number of profs by the number of students, by the number of rooms, by the number of core, like we've got a number that's so big, we couldn't possibly search that entire space, okay? But watch this. These constraints, that could be our environment. So if we have a candidate individual, like a candidate schedule, if the schedule satisfies these constraints, it's very fit and it should reproduce. If it doesn't, like if one student has five exams on one day, then it has a low fitness and it shouldn't reproduce. And so if we take the schedule as the individual and the constraints as the fitness, we could actually solve this problem as a genetic algorithm. And a, a funny note, the reason I chose this is because um, I did my honors thesis at MUN and the problem I worked on for my honors thesis at MUN was using um, evolutionary computing to schedule exams. At Mon. It was pretty interesting. I didn't come up with a great solution because I was, you know, just an undergrad, but it was a really interesting problem. So here is the entire evolutionary computation metaphor in a single slide. And I forgot to turn on uh, animations for this. So just give me a second. Here we go. All right. Here's the entire EC metaphor. Populations of individuals exist in an environment with limited resources. Competitions for those resources cause selection of fitter individuals that are better adapted. Those individuals that are better adapted reprodu reproduce to form a new generation of individuals through recombination and mutation. New individuals have their fitnesses evaluated. High fitness individuals are chosen to reproduce and pass on their good traits. Over time, this process mimics natural selection and causes fitness to rise, okay? This stuff is the stuff you should know because this is the algorithmic process that mimics the natural selection. So I don't wanna know about my meiosis or gametes or anything like that on an exam, but I do want to know this stuff, okay? So let's have a look at that in diagram form. So this is kind of going around in a circle so where's our population? We have our population up here. That's going to have some like binary or floating point or whatever representation. We'll talk about that in a bit. That population goes through an evaluation. The evaluations uh, basically assign fitnesses to each of the individuals. That's the environment. The environment assigns the fitness. Then we select parents and the parents are going to reproduce which does crossover. We're gonna talk about how we do crossover in our algorithms. And then we apply some mutation. And after some amount of time has passed or after some number of individuals have been produced by this, um, by this process, we get the next population, okay? So each of these is called a generation. Population, evaluation, reproduction, population, evaluation, reproduction, generation one, generation two, generation three, generation four. So evolutionary um, algorithms are going to be, their progress is going to be measured by their fitness over time. And the number of iterations is going to be called the generation number. So this is what's happening. So here is that process in pseudocode form. And pseudocode is always great for an exam, right? So the first thing we do is, okay, you may say, how are we actually gonna get the initial population? Typically what we do is we just set it up randomly. So we have an initial population. Let's say we have a thousand individuals. They're all going to be randomly uh, assigned traits. And then 
we have the process of evolution that's going to happen until some termination condition. And in, in real world computing, that termination condition is either going to be one of three things. It's going to be, have we reached a time limit? Um, have we reached a specific number of generations? Or has our fitness reached some predetermined value that we want? Okay, so for example, if we know what the maximum po possible fitness is, maybe we'll go until we reach that fitness. Or if I know I only have an hour to run this algorithm, maybe I'll just go till the hour is up. So the once we have the initial populations, the process that we want to repeat is evaluate that population and, and get all of the individual fitnesses, select parents from the population with high fitness, combine those parents to form offspring, mutate those offspring, and then those offspring form the next population. And then this process repeats, 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 repeats. And this over time, ideally, will raise the fitness of the population and give you good candidate solutions. And this is true of all evolutionary algorithms. They all follow this algorithm. So if you've ever heard of genetic programming, genetic algorithms, evolutionary strategies, this, they are all this algorithm. But there's a difference, which I'll show you. Different evolutionary algorithms have different representations. So each evolutionary algorithm follows this process. But what differentiates the evol evolutionary algorithms are their representations. So if you have an evolutionary algorithm and your genetic representation, so the genotype is binary strings or integers, then you have a genetic algorithm. So if I talk about a genetic algorithm, it still uses this exact process. However, the individuals are represented either by integer or binary strings, okay? If I talk about uh, evolutionary strategies, the only difference really is that instead of using integers, we have real valued vectors. Um, if we use a finite state machine as our representation, that is called evolutionary programming. And if we use Lisp trees, or I'll, I'll talk about genetic programming next time, but what is essentially a Lisp tree, we have genetic programming. And the differences are largely cosmetic, okay? So if someone asks you, should I use a genetic algorithm? Should I use evolutionary programming? Should I use evolutionary strategies? All you got to do is look at the problem and see how you're going to represent the individuals. And then that's the one that you choose. But they all follow this algorithm. It's just the representation that's different. Someone in the chat asked, what's Lisp? That is a very good question. Lisp is an old programming language. And the important part here is not that you have to use the Lisp programming paradigm or the Lisp language, but that in genetic programming, our data structure is represented by trees rather than by strings. Okay, so I'll talk about this in the next lecture. The next lecture is all about genetic programming. Um, and so instead of Lisp trees, let me put down uh, tree structure. There we go. So that, that's a good question. And I actually changed it because of it, because it doesn't have to be Lisp. It's just any sort of general tree structure. Um, that's genetic programming. All right. And I actually want to change one more thing. All right. So I'll, I'll do it like this. So now, now we've got them all lined up. There we go. So we got a tree structure. That is genetic programming. But the important part here, again, just to reiterate, is that the type of evolutionary algorithm only differs in representation. So the main components then of any evolutionary algorithm are the representation, meaning how we define the individuals, the evaluation or fitness function, the population, so the size and the shape of the population, the parent selection mechanism. So how do I select which individuals? Uh, sure, I have fitness numbers, but how do I select whichever one? that I want. The variation operators, meaning how do we combine parents to form an offspring or how do we mute things or mutate things, and also our survivor selection mechanism. So each of our EAs, evolutionary algorithms have a number of parameters 
And these essentially represent those parameters. And how we define all of these represents the parameters for our algorithm when we actually go to run the algorithm. So the representations. So candidate solutions are individuals. We already said that. They exist in the phenotype space. So I'm again, I'm, I'm driving home the difference between phenotype and genotype. The phenotype is the actual candidate solution that we are going to evaluate. The phenotypes are encoded into a genetic representation so we can run the evolutionary algorithm. Those encodings exist in the genotype space. So a genotype is a representation of a phenotype. So encoding is taking a phenotype and encoding it into a genotype and decoding is taking a genotype and take and putting it back into a phenotype. In order to find a global optimum to our solution, every possible solution must be represented in the genotype space. So what this means is, is that in order to get the best possible solution, you better be sure that whatever representation you have chosen as the genotype, okay, that can represent every possible phenotypic trait. So just to drive this home as a concrete example, here is an example. Here is the problem of Sudoku. If you don't know what Sudoku is, please pause the video now, go look up the rules for Sudoku. But essentially, Sudoku is a puzzle game where you have a grid, it's nine by nine, and it consists of nine individual squares. And the rules of Sudoku are, you are given, um, you have to place the numbers one through nine in this grid so that each of the numbers one through nine uh, is in each row, each column, and each smaller square. It's just a puzzle game, okay? This is the actual puzzle. This is the actual traits of the actual puzzle. That's the phenotype. The phenotype is the actual puzzle board. The genotype is a representation of that puzzle board that we could pass through a genetic algorithm or an evolutionary algorithm. So what we've done here, we've already talked about um, like hashing and mapping, phenot or mapping 2D structures to 1D structures. That's what we've done here. So if this has 81 elements, this one right here, this has 81, right? It's nine by nine. And we just take the top left thing, put it here. The next thing, put it here. The next thing, put it here. And then eventually we get this thing and put it here. Or sorry, that's supposed to go there. So the phenotype is the actual thing. The genotype is the representation of that thing that our evolutionary algorithm will work on. So what happens is in the evolutionary algorithm, let me get rid of these. Um, all right, in the evolutionary algorithm, all of our reproduction and mutation is gonna happen on the genotype. Then we are going to turn the genotype into the phenotype to evaluate its fitness. Then the next population, we're gonna have the new genotype. We do, its, we do the stuff on that, we, re, um, we recombine them, we do parent selection. And then, sorry, we do the crossover, we do the mutation, then in order to compute the fitness, we have to have the phenotype as well. So the fitness function. This represents an estimate of how well an individual will, will perform in a given environment. So how fit they are to reproduce. So remember that in the real world, there is no fitness function. The only fitness function in the real world, in actual evolution, is how how well do you reproduce? Did you reproduce? Then you're probably pretty fit. But in order to work with computers, we have to have numbers, right? And our fitness is our guess at how fit something is. So for example, the fitness function for a Sudoku board might be how close is it to being solved? Something like that. So the fitness function is going to assign a real valued number, so a like a floating point number, fitness to each phenotype which forms the basis for selection. Um, and the more fine-grained different values, the better. So you don't want to just have like a zero if it's bad and a one if it's good. Ideally, you have this on a scale that's like, you know, very varied so you could do cool things with selection. And typically what we want to do in a genetic algorithm or in any evolutionary algorithm is maximize the fitness. 
We want the fitness to become higher and higher over time. And of course, you know, some problems you want to minimize, maybe there's an error you want to minimize, but you can look at that as like maximizing one divided by the thing or whatever. Maximization and minimization are kind of the same thing. Here's an example fitness function of a Sudoku board. Okay, so what I've done here is I've taken a Sudoku board and I've just colored it. And I'm coloring it um, based on how solved every row, column, or square is. So for example here, um, I have a number on the right hand side of each row and that says how many different numbers are in this row right now. How many different numbers are in this column right now? Okay, and then the colors here, it's lighter if it has fewer conflicts and it's darker if it has more conflicts. Okay, so for example, this eight is very dark because it has a conflict in the row, it has a conflict in the column, and it has a conflict in the square. It has three conflicts, that's terrible. This nine, however, has no conflicts in the row, column, or the square, so I just colored it a bit lighter. Over here, you can see that I've done the same thing, but with the squares. So the green ones just mean that, okay, that entire square contains nine different things. So this is an example fitness function. We would want to maximize the sum of these numbers in order to solve a Sudoku board. Now, you could have a Sudoku fitness function that is way better than this. And on your assignment, you are going to be creating a Sudoku fitness function that hopefully is better than this. But this whole thing just essentially says, if the number is higher, then it's closer to our goal of solving the Sudoku. You could have way different fitnesses than this. So for example, here is a really cool thing where they invented some sort of uh, mechanical dinosaur and they're trying to teach it how to apply forces to this dinosaur in order to, turn it, uh, to tell it to walk. And so the fitness function here would be really simple. It was just how far did it walk? Right? And so you see here that at the start of the training, it was really bad. And time, like as training goes on by generation 900 here, the thing was walking. So the fitness can be as, you know, it can be, I guess this is kind of simple, but it could be some weird summation or formula. It could be just how far did it get? It could be how many enemies did it kill in this video game, right? There's lots of different fitness functions that we could have. The population, what is the population? So the population holds a representation of all the possible solutions. And it usually, in an EA, is going to have a fixed size. Some sophisticated EAs are going to have a special structure on the population in order to do some crazy optimizations. We're not worried about that right now. But essentially, for example, if we have a bunch of Sudoku boards represented like this, we'll just have a vector of vectors or a vector of arrays, right? That's going to be our population. And so selection operators take the whole population into account, typically. And the diversity of the population reflects the number of different fitnesses of the phenotypes and the genotypes, okay? So typically we do want a diverse population. What do I mean by a diverse population? Well, here is a graph that you are going to see in assignment four. What this graph shows is on the x-axis is the generation number. So that's how long our EA is running for. And on the y-axis is the current fitness value for our population. And I've got three different values here. One is the minimum fitness of my population. One is the maximum fitness of the population. And one is the average fitness of the population. So you can see here that there's quite a difference between the minimum possible fitness in this population and the maximum fitness of this population. But you can also see that the average fitness is kind of close to the top, right? Now, this is a pretty diverse population. If we look at something like this, this is not a diverse population. We've got a bunch of very similar individuals, right? And so what happens is typically, the more diverse your population, the more genes, like the bigger the gene pool is, right? And so you will be able to get more creative solutions and hopefully give you better overall quality over time. So you don't necessarily want to only be looking at the best possible solutions, right? You want to look at some of the bad ones as well because maybe they have some good ideas and through recombination, you'll get the best of those both worlds.
Okay, so diversity matters as well. Parent selection mechanism. This is going to assign variable probabilities of individuals as parents depending on their fitness. So what that means is you're just going to take higher quality or higher fitness individuals are going to be given a higher probability of reproducing. That's usually probabilistic. So high quality solutions are more likely to reproduce, but they're not guaranteed. We worst in the in the worst case, you do want to have a non-zero chance of picking something. So even if it's the worst one, you want there to be a small chance of that being picked. And so this stochastic nature, meaning a bit of randomness, can help escape local optima, meaning that as we go higher and higher, like as we get higher and higher fitnesses, it becomes more difficult to, to improve our fitness. And so we do want some randomness in there to say, okay, try and get out of this local optima. So the example parent selection mechanism we are going to use in this course for our assignment is roulette wheel selection. And roulette wheel selection is very, very easy to understand conceptually. So what we do is let's say that we have uh, this wheel. So it's just like wheel of fortune, right? We're spinning the wheel. Each of these um, pieces of the pie in here are our individuals and they are essentially given an area of the wheel proportional to their fitness, right? So this one here has a very large proportional fitness. Uh, this one is a bit less. This one here is very small. So if we spin the wheel, right? If we randomly spin the wheel, this is going to land on some portion of the, fit, of the, the population. It's going to have a higher probability of landing on the large fitness it's going to have a lower probability of landing on the lower fitness. So even though we want to pick higher fitness things, there's still every now and then we should pick a lower fitness one as well. So this is what we are going to be doing on our assignment. And this is the algorithm for that. And I'll show you exactly what that algorithm does. So over here, we are going to have our population fitnesses. So let me draw this. Okay, so, oops, there's one up at the top that you can't see, but I'll just not use that. Okay, so here's our population. I'm gonna record some fitnesses in there. So the first thing that we do is this step one, or this line here, which is determine all the fitnesses. So over here, we're going to have a vector or an array or a list or whatever of all the fitnesses of everything in our um, population. So let's just get some random numbers here. I'll go with 10, uh, maybe 2, 40, uh, 8, uh, another 2, 20, 30, and let's say 4. Okay? So those are the, the fitnesses of the things in our population. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to compute a sum. So we sum up everything in our population. Oh God, I made these numbers too difficult. Uh, here we have 12, 52, uh, 60, 80, 96. I, so I think our sum is 96. If it's not 96, I apologize. It doesn't matter too much, but I think it's 96. All right. So what we're going to do now is we pick a random number between zero and the sum. Okay, so we pick a random number between zero and the sum. Let's say we picked uh, 50. Okay, right in the middle. So we picked 50. That is our pick. And what the rest of this algorithm does is the following. And I'll, I'll show you visually before I get into the algorithm. So we're going to have a current sum. That current sum initially is going to be zero. So what I do is I go... Um, down my population like this. I start at the first one and I go down. I add the number to the current sum. So my current sum is 10. And I say, is 10 greater than the number that I picked, which is 50? If it is, that is the individual that I'm going to choose for selection. So here, 10 is not greater than 50. So I skip it. I go to the next one. What is my sum now? It's 12. Is 12 greater than 50? No, it's not. So I skip it. I go to the next one. Now I have 52. Is 52 greater than 50? Yes, it is. 
So this is the one I am going to select. And that's what it, this algorithm is, okay? That's what this down here does. I don't need to go over it because you know exactly what I just did. It's a pretty easy algorithm. So essentially what I've done is I've assigned just like this wheel, that's exactly what we've done. We've assigned portions of the wheel, different parts, and we've randomly selected where the wheel should stop. That's it. Okay, so that's the roulette wheel selection, and this is what you have to implement on assignment four. Variation oper operators. The role of the variation oper operators are to generate new candidate solutions. So going from parents to offspring. Usually, divided into two types according to their number of inputs. So mutation operators have one input, so you just take something and you mutate it. A recombination operator just has, it has more than one input. If we have two inputs, we have what we call crossover. And most EAs are going to both use recombination and mutation. How do we do this? Super easy, super, super easy. If we have two parents, Let's say this is one parent up here, and this is another parent down here. We're going to choose some crossover point. That crossover point is going to determine where we pick genes from both parents. So if you have two parents, you pick a crossover point, you're going to form two new offspring. And all you do is you take whatever's to the left of that point from one parent and whatever's to the right of that point from another parent, and you form a new vector or a new array. That's it. Same thing for the second one, the first part of one and the second part of the other. Couldn't be easier. Form two new arrays of the same size, take the first half of one, the second half of the other and form two new ones. That's it. In another case, maybe you want to do something like swapping. Swapping is another type of mutate or another type. Oh, sorry, geez, that's not, that's a, I'm talking about mutation now. So that's crossover. That crossover, super, super easy. Mutation can take, the, can take a different form. For example, if we have a binary string and we are hit by some sort of gamma radiation from whatever, right, or some sunspot or something flares up, our bit might flip. That is a mutation. So this bit is going to flip from a one to a zero. That's it. Or maybe we swap some things. We're essentially going to be changing things in some random manner. So what's going to happen in the assignment is I'm going to give you a mutation rate, and that mutation rate is basically going to say, take 10% of the individuals and flip one of the numbers. That, that's what mutation is. Also really easy. In more complicated examples, we could have one point crossover, two point crossover, uniform crossover. There's all sorts of different crossover. We'll just be doing one point crossover for our assignment. It's the easiest thing to do. Survivor selection, also really interesting. It's also called environmental selection. Most EA use a fixed population size and need a way from going from parents and offspring to the next generation. This is often very deterministic, okay? So you could use fitness-based, age-based, elitism. There's all sorts of different things that you can do. In our assignment, we are going to do fitness-based. So we saw that the more fit things are going to reproduce, we are also going to have an elitism based thing. So for example, we're going to say um, elitism has to do with the most fit things. So I'll have this parameter. Let's say my elitism ratio is 5%. It means that you're gonna take the top 5% of each population and just put it into the next population. So the best 5% from every population always lives on. That's just another parameter that we can tune in our algorithm. And then the last thing we need to worry about is initialization and termination. How do we start and how do we stop? So initialization is usually done randomly. We need to ensure some even mixture of possible candidates. Um, it could include like some existing solutions or heuristics or whatever, but we're just gonna be using randomness for our assignment. And then the termination condition for our assignment is can be one of these things. It can be, or sorry, not for our assignment, but for our, um, in general, when we run EAs, the termination condition is either going to be some known or desired fitness, a generation limit, a minimum diversity, uh, no improvement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in our assignment, I'm just gonna have, to have you hit run and it'll run forever. So you don't need to worry about the termination condition for the assignment. 
So what happens? The typical behavior of an evolutionary algorithm. So let's look at what I have here. What does this represent? Over here, this x-axis essentially represents individuals, okay? So I'm gonna have individuals um, and they're in some space of the genotypes. So these are like, for example, possible Sudoku boards, okay? Each of those is going to be evaluated to some fitness level. So we're drawing lines here and basically what we have is a graph like this, right? We have some individuals, those individuals are evaluated. What this line represents is if we had infinite individuals on this line, here's what the, the fitness would look like for each of these individuals, if we have infinite of them, right? What we are going to see here is that certain individuals, depending on where they are in the genotypic space, are going to be able to reach different heights of fitness, right? For example, if I have a Sudoku board and I have just like a Sudoku board and there's one part of the Sudoku board is just all sixes. It's terrible, right? So that might be right here. It might have a terrible fitness and all of its neighbors, if I just make small changes to that genotype, it's still probably going to be terrible, right? And in the best case, I might be able to reach this like local optimum of fitness value. And so what these humps represent is a local optimum. Over here might be the global optimum. And what it means is if I take my genetic algorithm and I recombine parents and I make these small mutations, usually what happens is I can sort of jiggle this and make it move toward the local optimum. So maybe this is the initial random population. Then the second population, they start to move toward these peaks. And by, you know, some number of populations, this is what I get. I get some individual candidates have converged over here to this local optima and some have converged to this local optima. But the issue is it's very possible that there's a global optimum over here that none of my solutions have gotten to, right? That is very, very possible in this space. Now, some problems are called convex optimization problems. Convex optimization problems have a single hump, okay? And if you have a single hump, then the GA is going to very easily get all of your solutions up to that single part or that single global optimum. There are no local optima in a convex optimization problem. So it's like really, really easy. So for example, if you just took a problem of summing up all the numbers in an array, it doesn't matter what solution you currently have, you're always going to be able to get to the, to the optimal thing. But in general, more complex problems are going to have these global optima that are going to be difficult to get to because you're gonna get stuck in these local optima. Because changing this one right here probably won't jump you all the way over here. In Sudoku, it might look something like this. Sudoku, I have chosen very particularly for because it is probably the worst problem in the world for local optima. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, here in this Sudoku problem, I apologize to people who are green, red, colorblind. I am, I guess it doesn't matter because you might see the circle, you might not. In these two columns, you have an error, right? You have two ones here and you have two threes here. This Sudoku board is so close to being solved, right? So this Sudoku board might be this one right here. But if you're familiar with Sudoku, it may not be possible for you to get from this board and only make a few changes to get to the solution. Because maybe in order to get to the solution, you have to change this to a six, and then you have to change this one, and it's a chain reaction of a bunch of stuff that you have to choose. So it's very possible in Sudoku that you have this example where the actual global optimum completely solved thing is may not be obtainable from one of these local optima. So I hope that this is, 
is understandable to you, okay? And the reason we include randomness and mutations is so that, you know, two parents in this local optima will never get to this global optima. But maybe we could introduce enough random stuff to kind of shake this one over to this one. That's why we want mutations, because mutations can help us escape from local optima. Another cool thing, or maybe it's not cool, maybe it's actually depressing, but a typical genetic algorithm run looks something like this. If this is the number of time and generations, and this is the best fitness, this is the progress that you make in the first half of the time that you're running, while, excuse me, this is the progress that you make in the second half of the time that you're running. Genetic algorithms very quickly, here's why I, here's when I tell people to use a genetic algorithm. I tell people, if you want a very close to optimal solution very quickly, use a genetic algorithm. But if you must have an exactly optimal solution, do not use a genetic algorithm. So a genetic algorithm is better to be used when, say you've got like, a, I don't know, like a max possible solution up here. If you want to get to like almost that solution really quickly, way faster than a ton of other algorithms, you should use this algorithm. But because if you, for example, need the exact solution to a Sudoku, a complex Sudoku, I would not necessarily use a genetic algorithm because of this problem. But other problems, I would say use GA if you're fine with getting really close really soon. And you will find that you get really quick progress in just a few uh, generations, but then it kind of stalls. And your job through introducing uh, different parameters like mutation rates, etc., is to, you can get very easily stuck in something like this, what you would want to do is have some good randomness in around here somewhere that jumps you up another level and then jumps you up another level and jumps you up another level. And so we'll talk about a bit that a bit more when we get back to the assignment. So just realize that that is what an evolutionary algorithm is and what it does. Those are the systems that it uses and the different types of EAs just use different representations. In assignment four, we will be using the simplest representation, which is an integer representation. So we'll be doing a genetic algorithm but it still has this exact same process, which is initialize a random population, then forever do the following. Evaluate the fitnesses, select parents, combine the parents to form offspring, mutate the resulting offspring, and that forms the next population. If you want to see a really cool genetic algorithm um, working in real time, I would recommend going to this website and playing around. So let me uh, really quickly show you what this is. It is a genetic algorithm for driving cars, okay? So what happens is the genotype here is a bunch of different angles which specify, let me show you, if I take this and uh, I'm just gonna go into MS Paint, I'm not gonna bother loading up the, um, the, the blackboard right now, but what they've done is they have specified, okay, there's a number of parameters to this. So how are they going to encode it? Well, here is their genotype. I know this is a little bit small, forgive me. Let me maximize this, I guess. There we go. So their genotype is up here and they are going to encode this cur into a genotype. So maybe they have, um, this is the radius of the first wheel. Maybe this is the radius of the second wheel. Um, these angles and these lengths are the other parameters. So they're always going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So they'll need 16 of these things. This might be angle one and length one, angle two and length two, angle three, length three. So they're encoding a cur in this genotype and then their fitness function is turn on the wheels and see how far this individual got in this environment. And then they do a bunch of different, um, they do a bunch of different runs until they all stop. And then the next generation is, is produced from that. And it's a really, really cool example. And I'll paste this now out in the chat so you can have a look at it. Our assignment four is not necessarily gonna be this cool. I didn't wanna just take their 
representation and sort of rob it from them. Um, but I, I highly recommend playing around with this because it's a really interesting um, uh, example that just runs right in your browser.